You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bud, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. Hey, this is Repo Ron from Lizard Lick Tone Recovery, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Radio Network, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Radio Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bod Father. And as always, I'm bringing you guys and gals awesome interviews. And today, it's an honor and a huge privilege to welcome Ron Shirley of the reality TV show, Lizard Lick Towing and Recovery. Also, Ron is the pastor of the Eastern Chapter of Dirt Church and Evangelist by Grace. And we got Ron on here. We're going to be talking to him about all this stuff. So, Ron, how you doing, dude? Oh, I'll tell you, I'm getting old, fat, and ugly, but I'm so good at it, I figure I'll stick with it a few more years. Oh, man, I got competition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, let's hop right into this. What all happened with the pandemic during all this stuff with your business, man? Let's talk about that just a little bit. How did it affect everybody? And all honestly, you know, we, we um, especially, you know, we have steered a lot towards specializing in uh, private property impounds and stuff now. Right when the pandemic hit, we had kind of made that transition, and it really has almost came to a complete stop for us. I mean, a lot of the places that we worked were very sympathetic, and, of course, with the eviction uh, monitorium. And people just having such a hard time. Most of the places that we, you know, tow out of, we were not towing. So we just, you know, stuck it out, found some ways to make money here and there, you know, hit some other avenues, Bo. And to be honest with you, you know, by the grace of God, we made it. And we've come through it. And now, I'm honestly, we're busy in a bubble being a bucket of tar. So I'm just, I'm fortunate to work for companies, in all honesty, that care about the people that live there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because this pandemic, man, it's hit everybody hard, and and slowly but surely we're all getting out of it. But uh, it just seems like the the light is getting brighter and brighter, but slower and slower each day. I agree, hundred percent. And the problem is, you don't know what to believe, what not to believe. I mean, you can't, you know. I I don't want to get into politics or anything like that because mm-hmm. I try to stay as far away from that as I can. But I mean, I'd I'd honestly rather be super glued to a bottom end of a moose during mating season but you just you don't know what to believe i mean you don't know who to believe what to believe how to believe it i mean so you got to just kind of i think that's what's making it so slow is because everybody's trying to figure it out you know for themselves and that's that takes a little bit of time what made you want to have lizard lick towing and recovery as a tv show man what was it spark for you that said i I may want to give this a try possibly oh i'll be honest with you i never tried to get on tv um I didn't have much choice back in the day uh, when we opened the company. I mean, I, we, me, our family, both me and my brother, were so poor we rode devil on our stick horse. And, you know, we had good raising, but I mean, from the time I was in the eight, nine years old, we were in back of fields working. I mean, that's all we ever knew. And when I went to college, I came back, and uh, you know, I had to pay. We had to work our tails off to pay our way through college, all of us. And I was roofing one day and got hit by a bolt of lightning and took a direct strike. So um, it honestly ended football, college, everything. It was about a year before I recovered. And when I came out, the only thing I seemed to be pretty good at was finding cars for people. So that's how I got into the business. And fast forward, you know, 18, 19 years, and I'm married to a world champion power lifter, MMA fighter, and licensed mortician. And wife swap found her, not me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm not a perfect person, and uh, I got a pretty checkered past. Um, and so, you know, they're like, hey, bro, you can't be on wife swap. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I don't care. And next thing you know, they, they're like, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to film your wife in the funeral home, and we're going to film you at work. And it took about seven hours, and they were sending contracts down here. So, I mean, for me, it's always, I told everybody, but God put us there and fans kept us there. But it was just, they came to us, you know, never, sorry about that, but never, never did we ever try to go to them. And you said it right there. I mean, you, basically, you've got to do what you got to do to provide for your family. It, it's only you that's going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it for you. Oh, no, I mean... Just because you have a bad job don't mean you're a bad person. Right. You know, we bring bad news, I mean. But everybody hits hard times, and just because you hit bad times don't mean you're bad people. It's just how you treat people. And, I mean, I think the biggest thing for us is we just we are who we are. Who you see on TV, Bo, is who we are. I mean, being born in an oven don't make you a biscuit. No more than being on TV makes you famous. We're just regular country folks. So 
I think that was why our fan base was so great, and, and I mean they stuck with us all these years, and it's just been it's been a phenomenal ride. I mean I've seen and done things I never thought I'd do, you know, growing up. After the show's first episode, what was your thoughts on moving forward with it? Did you think, oh, I don't know how long this is going to last? This seemed pretty good. Then what did you think of like all the ratings and everybody uh, talking about it? Well, the first time they aired us was actually a uh, it was our pilot. It was called All Fired Up, and. Uh, it was about an hour long, and it actually aired right after a NASCAR race. And, you know, for for a guy this country is a baked bean sandwich, I mean, you couldn't pick a better airing time unless we going to talk, you know, wrestling. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, man, we were pumped. And, I mean, I thought it was the greatest thing ever, you know, the first episode aired. And it was like, oh, this is great. The ratings were great. Everything was phenomenal. And, you know, um, you know, didn't get a lot of feedback. So then, you know, they came back and said, all right, well, they want to pick you up, so let's go. And so we signed a contract, started filming. And then when the first show aired, the actual show started airing on weeknights. Um, our first one aired on a Monday night at 9 o'clock. And by Tuesday at 3, I had lost almost 75% of my business. Oh, wow. Yep. Jeez. What was the factor of turning it around, though? I mean, well, the biggest problem was... You know, doing repossessions, I work for a lot of primary lenders. Uh, a lot of, I mean, I work for thirty some odd banks, and right. they just felt like we were a lawsuit risk. You know, we got on TV, and corporate America doesn't want to be seen as a bad guy. And so, you know, it, I'm telling you, Bo, it it went over like a pregnant pole vaulter here. I mean, by the end of the week, I was like, what have we done? But I'll never forget, man. It, it uh, the ratings were good that week, and Amy came to me, and I, I ain't gonna lie, bro. I'm, I'm a grown man, but if somebody tell you men don't cry, they don't know too many men. Mm-hmm. And I was, but I was in there, my, you know, my eyes were water. I'm like, what have I done? You know, we built this company from nothing. You know, we're one of the largest independent repo companies in North Carolina, and you know, in one week I've thrown it away. And she said, look, you know, you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus. And uh, last I remember, when you jump out the boat, you ain't supposed to, you know, doubt. You decide to jump out the boats and have faith, and uh, that that week was my turning point. I said, you know what, you're right. You know, this came to us. We felt like it was the thing we were supposed to be doing, so we just stuck it out. And I mean, everybody says that the turtle beat that hare in the race. I don't believe it. I still think the hare won, but turtle gets all the glory, so I don't mind being the turtle. <laughs> I know it's a show, and I know this is your actual job, too, but uh, were you in any serious situations while you were filming on or off the air with the camera crew and while you were repoing, man? I mean, you have to have some serious situations to where you have to back up and say, wait, you know, let's do this another way. Yeah, I mean, see, the, it really it really changed so much when we first started. We had two cameramen and a sound guy. And, I mean, 95% of what you saw was real as it happened. I've, I never had fake blood on the show. If I was bleeding, I was bleeding. I mean, I'm not going to say we didn't provoke a lot of people back in the day. Um, you know, sometimes we might pick up a car, nobody be home. We go back at 2 o'clock in the morning and beat the horn. I mean, needed footage. But, I mean, some of the situations got really bad. And, I, you know, try to talk to cameramen into leaving. I mean, we had one cameraman get his back broke. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we had one cameraman put in a coma. I mean, we had some very serious situations when it first started. And, Right about toward the end of the second season of Lizard League Towing, which is four full seasons, there's 26 episodes in every season, you know, they came to us and said, look, we just, we can't find no cameramen to work on your show. It's too dangerous. They all want to work for, you know, uh, Bear Grylls. And I'm like, you're telling me my show is more dangerous than Bear Grylls? <laughs> you know, I mean, so they, they didn't want to work on our show because it was dangerous. I mean, this was, we were doing repos, so... They started, you know, trying to add a little flavor to it and putting their hand in it. And for years, it was their top show. And so, you know, we led them a little bit at the time. And by the time we hit the fourth season, it was pretty much them. And we were miserable. And so at the end of the fourth season, we just told them, said, look, you know, this this, this show has gotten faker than Pamela Anderson's front side. And I'll be 100% <laughs> honest with you, we're not happy. We're not going to continue. Y'all don't want to continue. So we just, we're going to part ways. And I don't know if that was the right decision, but it was the decision that we felt we could best live with and still be parents and still run a company and still live in this community and we haven't looked back since would you ever go back to doing reality tv show for for the company for that company no for lizard lick i mean to put it out there you know yeah i mean you know honestly yes if we could be real and when i say real i mean all tv has some drama i mean i don't care what it is i mean 
I believe we were one of the realest reality shows that ever hit the air. We never were eligible for an award because we didn't have scripts. We didn't have writers. You know, we couldn't go get the Golden Moose Award for hunting or anything else. I mean, and all the other shows were always on there. Um, if they let us be real and let us be us, I, I mean, sure. I mean, I'd be on it like a hobo on a ham sandwich. <laughs> but the problem is when something starts becoming successful, everybody wants to put their name on it. And to put their name on it, they have to get involved in it. And, you know, I guess the nicest way I can say it is I can't go to Korea and do a show about Korean heritage if I've never lived in Korea, don't speak Korean, and, and don't know the people. You can't come down here where we're at in the world we live in, coming from a large city, corporate America, you know, never been in a tow truck, don't know anything about the style of life that's lived around here, country folk, and, and try to do a show. So the stuff they started doing was just, I mean, they had hens laying eggs on my floor, hardwood floors. I'm like, y'all do know a hen will not lay an egg on a hardwood floor. I mean, I'm just saying. You know, people with flamethrowers. I mean, it's just things that you would see in, you know, a movie, but it would just never happen. And so as long as we could do a show and leave that out, I don't mind having a little drama. But, you know, you can't make my wife cheat on me. You can't make my daughter look like a crackhead. You can't have chickens laying eggs on a hardwood floor. It just mm-hmm. it doesn't go over. And that's the thing that we promised our fans. is like, look, when you meet us, it's us. You come to the shop, we're here working. The truck's run every day. I mean, please don't pinch me to see if I'm real. But, I mean, you're more than welcome to take a picture and see if it develops, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, so, you know, in that case, yes, but I would not give up the time that I gave up back then. You know, I went I went seven years without seeing my boy play a football game. Oh, wow. Yeah, back then, you know, you think you're doing everything for the benefit of your kids. You want to give them things that, no, you could never give them and you never had. And you get a little older and you look back and you say, you know, money's not worth time. Mm-hmm. And you can't buy memories. I don't care who you are. You can't buy memories. Memories are made, and they're, they're, they're made with people you love from the heart. And You can't buy those things. And I mean, I missed seven years of memories. So, I, yeah, would I do it 100%, but it would have a whole lot of different parameters at this time. Was there anything difficult to adjust for you personally uh, while during the filming and everything of the show? <laughs> everything was difficult to adjust to. I mean, you know, we're still running a business in real life, and then we're trying to film. So, and no exaggeration, I mean... There were weeks where we would work five, six, seven, 18, 19 hour days, going three, four, five, six hour sleep tops, six, seven, eight, nine days in a row. And um, it just wore on us. Uh, it wore on us, you know, in so many ways. But I guess, you know, the thing that was hardest to get used to was walking in somewhere and just people just coming up to you. You couldn't eat a meal. You couldn't go to the movies. You couldn't go to the mall. You know, I'm, I'm just a regular guy. I mean, I mean that sincerely. I mean, but I'm like every other man in this world. First thing we do when we get up in the morning is take a leak. <laughs> I'm, I'm a guy. I'm just yeah. a regular guy. Yeah. And so, really, I wasn't ready for that. And, and I never minded it. It's just nobody teaches you that. And then nobody teaches you, you know, nobody ever comes to you when you, when you, you know, hit the ladder that quick and says, look, you got to watch out for this, this, and this. So, that, it was just a lot of adaption, a lot of learning as you go, and you're going to make mistakes. But, you know, just the popularity and, and the way people just flocked to us just kind of caught me off guard. I mean, I loved every second of it because I love people, but that was a big adjustment. I mean, if you wanted to eat a steak, you better cook it at home. So this really took a toll on you and your family personally then? Oh, tremendously. I mean, we, me and Amy are fortunate. We got two moms that are angels, I mean, straight angels. And uh, so, you know, they helped so much with the kids and, you know, helped us. You know, when we had to be at the business, when we had to film. So, I mean, we had so much family support. That's the only reason we were able to make it. And our marriage, you know, didn't really suffer at all. I know that sounds crazy, but everything we did, we did together. And, yeah, of course, you get tired of each other, but if we did a meet and greet, we did it together. We never did anything separate. We never let people in our lives. We never let, you know, never got on Facebook and had private messaging and never, you know, I wouldn't go to a meet and greet by myself and she wouldn't either because we felt like our marriage was a sacred thing. So we kept each other covered. And I think that's a big part of it because the last time I saw a report about three years ago said that over 74% of couples on TV get divorced within three years. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Jeez. I didn't even realize so, that. Yeah. You, you start looking at all the couples on TV and most of them at the end after it's over said and done end up in divorce. And a lot of TV shows are made on divorce. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say no names, but I know there's one with initials of Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, you know, Kate plus eight, Octomom. I mean, think about all those, all divorces. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, when you start looking at it, you're like, you know, a lot of people do get on reality TV, and then there's issues. And it's, it is a toll, and it's because nobody prepares them and nobody works with them and nobody tells them. So, you know, since the show's over, we work with so many people that have gotten on TV since and just, hey, we can't tell you what to do or how it's going to be, but look here, we've drank out of that stream right there, and uh, I can tell you where to drink and where not to drink. So, you know, next time you take your horse up there, you might want to head this way. And it's worked out pretty good. I mean, we we made a lot of friends along the way. I've always said that if I ever had that opportunity to make it in what I'm doing as a podcaster, and I've interviewed some of Metal's royalty people, you know what I mean? Legendary people. Oh, yeah. But I'm still the same guy. I don't act like I'm nobody else. I, I, I'm like, you know, I put my clothes on the same way everybody else does. I take a leak every morning, you know what I'm saying? Just like you said, I, I haven't changed, and I never will change because I know the struggle, and I've been there, and I still am there. You know, a, a guy that, now I won't even drop his name, but he's he is a big-time podcaster tv announcer i mean he's huge i mean he's one of the world's biggest right now but i'm you know had a couple of conversations with him years ago we have some of the same interests and he told me something that really changed the way i looked at things he said you know when you when you get even to the middle of the mountain the top of the mountain anywhere on the side of the mountain he said and you know people are looking up looking up looking up he said everybody will say you've changed he said but what most people don't realize is a lot of people do change and it's not for the better but then a lot of people don't change but their perception of you changes so now that you, you know, they think you got a little money and they come needing to borrow something, you don't give it to them, well, now you're greedy. Or, you know, if you can't come to their son's birthday party, now you're selfish. Um, you know, different things like that. And so that really just hit home because he's like, you know, so many people, if, if you can stay true to your roots, so many people, it's their perception of you that changes. And in doing so, they think you've changed. And so me and Amy, I'm not going to say we're perfect. I'm not going to say they won't, uh, you know, times we probably have been rude and obnoxious and, you know, you, everybody gets burned out. Everybody has bad days. I'm, I'm sure. not going to say it was, but 99 times out of 100, I tried to be the most approachable person in the world. If we went to a, a theme park, Amy would do stuff with the kids while I took pictures. I mean, you know, because you have an obligation to people. Those are the ones that that, that are watching you every week, and that's that's one of the things I hate so much about some of these athletes today and, and some of these role models is I think that they get so large in life that they forget. That, that at one time, the only thing that mattered was somebody supporting them or they wouldn't be where they are now. So mm-hmm. we just tried to never get like that. So you actually went over to the U.K. and and, and did your hand at and, antiquarian and car business. Let's talk about that a little bit. What so, <laughs> what happened with that, dude? What, what led you to go so over there? In, in the U.K., we, we were like what Duck Dynasty was here at the time. Yeah. Um, we started doing truck fest over there for a large promotion. And I'm telling you, Bo, it, it it was it was nutting a squirrel turd. I mean, we'd get <laughs> off the plane, we go to these meet and greets, and this is for three straight years. And and, and things are very different in, in England, the United Kingdom. And I'm gonna tell you, I've had some of the I had a ball over there every time I went. But it's just a different way of life. And so they don't have fairs like we have, and they don't have like it's just so different. They don't have the things we have here that we take for granted. They're like you know, there's not as much to do as far as socially. So they have truck fest, and uh, it's like a truck show for big lorries, which we call semis, tractors. But they would put a tent up in the middle of a soccer field, and you know, a bunch of booths and some rides, whatever. And I'm not exaggerating. They would open the gates at eight. We would get in the booth at eight thirty, and at nine fifteen they would close our lines, and we wouldn't leave to eight that night. People would line up around this field four times. I, if it rained, if it snowed, they did not care. I've never seen people that were so just diehard rabid to meet you, and they, you know, so polite. So, I mean, over there, it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was, I can't even tell you. I mean, the only thing I can compare it to, it'd be like if Mark Wahlberg walked out in the middle of the street today, now here. I mean, it was that crazy. And uh, so, you know, they they were like, come on, do a TV show over here, do a TV show over here. And I'm like, no, but I'm a mama's boy. I, I, y'all ain't got grits. Y'all ain't got sweet tea. Y'all ain't got hunt. Y'all ain't got fishing. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm saying, and y'all, you know, and y'all still calling soccer football. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, bo, I can't leave my mom and my kids. So they eventually convinced me to stay over there for six months and do a show, and we did. And, and I mean, it was a great time, and we got to travel all of England. We've been to Ireland. We've been to Scotland. We've been to so many places, but... You know, it was great, but honestly, that's when I really hit the brick wall on. I, I went six months without seeing my kids, and I just, if I wanted to travel the world like that, I'd be in the military, and I mean that sincerely. I'd be doing something where I, uh, I'd be on a cruise ship, you know, something where I had to travel. And I told him, I said, you know, me and Amy are done. This is it. Um, 
I just this will kill my marriage. And there's no amount of money and there's no amount of fame or fortune that's worth my kids and my wife. I don't I don't care what it is. So I came home and you know, I, I never regret what I did over there, but I'm glad we stopped. But what does that mean to you when you had people lining up to meet you guys? And even today, they they still are huge fans of you guys. What's that still mean to you today personally? You know, I don't ever look at it like it makes me anybody special because it don't. You know, right. I, I, I look at it like this. You know who Billy Graham is? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you know the name of the man to live, Billy Graham, in the Sinner's Prayer? I think so. Okay, well, most, if you ask a hundred people, unless they're a pastor or a big time, you know, theologian, they can't tell you, but the guy's name is Mordecai Ham, who learned under Billy Sunday, the ball player. But we can't all be Billy Graham. That's the bottom line. But every one of us can be Mordecai Ham. And it's all about the one. How does it make me feel, Bo? I mean, I'm having a mule chewing on bumblebees because. Oh, if I can change one person's life or change one person's day or change one person's attitude or change one person's weekend, make them smile, see a kid just grinning their ears. You know, I had, we, we still have four or five, six hundred people a week stop by the office here. Yesterday we were closed. It was 730 at night. You know, I seen some boys from a baseball team walk up, probably mid-teens with their coach. You know, we go outside and take pictures. Oh, them was happy as a jackrabbit on moonshine. And, and that that is worth every second of what we do. I mean, just just to bring some joy into somebody's life. That's what it's all about. Is just just for five minutes or two minutes, they forget about all their problems, Bo. And all we talk about is lit life and Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. And you know, it's, <laughs> it's you know, Bo. That's it's what it's all about, Bo. I mean, everybody nowadays, you know, I heard, you know, everybody's arguing over politics and stimulus and uh, reparations and critical race theory. Mm-hmm. Oh, we need a we need a critical grace theory. That's what we need. We need to give each other more grace. We need to care about each other more and try to just change a life for a day. I, all that other stuff we can argue about to the end of time is we still gonna argue, but if we give each other some grace, that's gonna change somebody's life. And that's all we need to do is change one person's view, one person's life, make one person smile. Bo, so I love every second of it. You hit the nail on the head, man. Like everything is so toxic. You can't talk to nobody because they end up. You know, start an argument like you said. You're right, and it's like, I'm so sick of the toxic. I'm so sick of all the negativity. I mean, it's just like, let's help each other. Let's you know do something positive besides, oh, well, this is getting that one, this is getting this. Well, go get your own. I mean, we all need to help each other. And you're right. And the problem with that in society is, if we ever do that, we become unified, and you cannot control unified people. And I mean that. I'm not talking politics. I'm right. talking civilizations. Right. You cannot control a unified people if the people unify under each other nobody can control them they they become the power but as long as you can keep the people diversified you can hold the power and so you know the way i look at it's like this my the the the, the god i serve says give the caesar what caesar and god's what's god caesar says i gotta wear a mask i'll put on my mask whether i like it or not caesar says i gotta pay taxes i'll pay taxes whether i like it or not caesar says i gotta do this caesar says i gotta do that i'll do it but God says, given him what is him, and what is him is joy and love and peace and grace. So, again, I'm nowhere near perfect, but, man, if I can share any bit of that through a TV show or through a tow truck or through a picture, oh, that's what life's about. I mean, I make enough people mad in a week to start a small war around here, seriously. But, I mean, yeah. if I make 100 people mad because I'm doing a job and I make one person happy because I was on TV, I'll trade 100 for the one every day. Are you doing anything right now differently other than your job? I mean, just anything else uh, for Lizard Lick or, or anything personally for you? Are you doing anything new possibly? You know, we, we're we probably, you know, we're playing with a lot of ideas, to be honest with you. Um, we're playing with a lot of, of just things that, that Amy's always supported me 100% in everything I've done. And, you know, I, I've been encouraging her to start doing some things that she wants to do. You know, she has a heart for so many things. And, and so, you know, we're looking at some things like that. Um, as far as, you know, I've been against TikTok since it came out. My kids finally taught me to get on it, and it's really just blowing <laughs> up. So doing a lot of TikToks here lately. I had not done something in about two weeks, but, I mean, it just, you know, the fans are just wanting to see stuff. So I'm, but I try to do stuff that's funny or stuff that's really meaningful or whatever. But we're looking at several things. We started two more shows, and both of them immediately turned south. And in doing so, you know, they, you know, they come in with this whole bowl of cherries, but by the time you got to them, they want nothing but crab apples. So, you know, we walked away. And I mean, and I, and I, I know that they're amazed that we're walking away because, Bo, I assure you, we ain't got money like people think. We want a very small network, and we're very blessed, and we work really hard. But, 
You don't see too many on TV, people on TV still working 60, 70 hours a week, and we are every week. I mean, I'm still here tonight at work. When we get our phone, I work another five hours, and uh, I was in here at 7 o'clock this morning. So, oh, I, mean, wow. this, I mean, that's what we have to do. You know, we're trying to make ends meet, and True TV, you know, left on us enough money to buy an island and file BK. Well, the company worked for the True file BK. So, you know, we got taken advantage of, but, again, it was worth it. So what we're doing differently now is we're enjoying life. We're enjoying what we do. We're enjoying... You know, if it ain't but a two-minute video, if it ain't but a kid coming into office, if it's whatever, we're enjoying it and we're taking the time to actually appreciate it and to kind of take it in, you know? I want to talk about music just for a little bit because that's what I cover a lot. Do you have a go-to album, Ron, or a song that gives you inspiration or just lets you escape uh, when you listen to it, just like everybody else? But I want to know what that album is or song for you, possibly. You know, I don't, and I, I... it depends on the situation for me. Um, so I don't have a go-to. And the reason I don't have a go-to is, I mean, honestly, I'm into every genre there is. There, I mean, there, I listen to everything under the sun. And, I mean, just depending on what's going on that day, what's that mood, you know, I, you know, if if I want to be, you know, if it's just one of them really bad days, you know, I, I'll listen to some Lecrae or some NF, um, stuff like that. But, I mean, you know, like yesterday I was listening to the, it ain't clean. It's got a lot of beats. But, like, you know, yesterday I got in the truck, and I was just in a great mood and going out to work. And, boy, I, I was cranking up, you know, X going to give it to you by DMX. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm into so much stuff. My go-to genre is going to be uh, dirt rock or hip-hop, um, country rap. And, uh, you know, I love all them guys. I've met so many of them. I actually released an EP with four songs about five years ago that did unbelievable Um you know, called Lick Life, and I uh, did it with DJ Silver, Kyle from Matchbox 20, um, Low Cash Cowboys, Charlie Farley, Marty Ray. So, you know, I had some, just some bangers on there. And uh, I've got the chance to, you know, hang out and talk on a personal level with, you know, like Twangin' Round and, you know, Bubba Mathis and just, you know, with DJ Silver. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I get to meet people like Cowboy Troy, who's the innovator of hip-hop, and, you know, hang out with Jason Aldean or Brantley Gilbert or Luke Bryan. And, I mean, the list goes on and on. So, And I love them all. But the ones that hit me the most, in all honesty, are the ones that tell a story. Um, I don't know if you've heard Maggie's, Maggie's song. It's a kind of a new one about a dog. Um, anything that tells a story, anything that kind of grabs your heart, anything that, you know, uh, anything like that is is when I think that things are just really going down in my life, I listen to stuff like that because, man, it, it makes you appreciate the small things. Mm-hmm. It makes you remember that, you know, we are, man, we are so fortunate to take another breath. We're so fortunate to be able to go see our kids. We're so fortunate to have a car to drive, a house to live in. You know, in England, not many people have, they say, ice is a commodity. I mean, it's hard to find ice. You know, you, you know, I mean, there's just so many things. When I came back to the United States, I was like, oh, we got it so easy over here. And so, you know, I listen to songs that really just tell a story. Cowboy's Hat by Chris Ledoux. Um, there's so many of them, man. Um, Today's a Good Day by Ice Cube. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying because, you know, he made it through a day. And in and, and that song, to me, he was thrilled to death to make it through a day. That's what the whole song's about. I made it a day. We're worried about what's going to happen next year. You've got people growing up in, in the hood that are under such violence and such, you know, there's so much danger. That they just want to make it home at night. And so I listen to stuff like that. It makes me just kind of reflect. I mean, you know, and of course, a lot of old Johnny Cash, Merle Whalen, you know, a lot of old school. You know, I love Pete Rock, Hell Smooth, and, you know, I still listen to Slick Rick sometimes. And so, I mean, you know, ACDC, Leonard Skinner, I mean, I'm telling you, it just depends on the mood, where I'm working, if it's raining or not raining, if the sun's shining, if the rainbow's out. I mean, that's, that's how I figure out what I'm going to listen to that day. But, you know, I spend at least six to eight hours a day in a truck yeah so music's all you got i mean that's all you got yeah music is that's all you have so man slick rig you're going way back into the 80s out there dude <laughs> i mean curtis curtis blow <laughs> you know yeah. basketball and the sugar hill gang and i mean back when you know krs1 come i mean i'm telling you i listen to all that so i mean it was just you know it was crazy the stuff i hear i play stuff for my son now i mean i kid you not i was uh the uh I was playing a song by the band not long ago for my son. Uh, and that's an old group right there now. Yeah. And he's like, who, he's like, who plays that? I'm like, the band. He's like, I get that. What band? I'm like, the band. I mean, this is, he's serious. He's like, Dad, you trying to be serious? And I said, 
it's the band. That's the name, the band. He said, all right, I don't hear it no more. I'm like, dude, it's the band. It took me 10 minutes to convince him. I had to get it on the phone to show him it's the band. He's like, what a stupid name. <laughs> oh, there's more out there. <laughs> well, yeah, but I was like, stupid. I said, Bo, you'll never forget that now. I yep. mean, you won't. Old medicine show. And I mean, I'm like, Bo, the names nowadays are a little different. But back then, I mean, they had some names now. <laughs> Oh, there's a band that I like from the 60s, 60s, 70s, uh, because they were kind of the kings of distortion uh, back for rock and everything called Blue Cheer. And nobody hardly ever hear, talks about them. I'm like, they're the forefathers of like creating distortion along with Black Sabbath. I'm like, good God, folks. Oh, yeah. I mean, you get on Black Sabbath, Judas Priest. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, Battle Striker switched over. And, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, oh, my gosh, man, that brings back memories, man. Scorpion and. But, uh, you know, it's, it, there's a, uh, it's funny cause I, li- I don't know if you've ever heard of Gangsta Grass, no. um, but I listened to a group called Gangsta Grass. It has a guy in it, um, called Tones and, uh, they actually, you remember the show, um, Justified? Yeah. So they did the thing for Justified. That's by Gangsta Grass. It is bluegrass and rap. Oh, nice. That's awesome. And I'm telling you, it is unbelievable, and nobody knows about it. I mean, unbelievable. It's uh, they got some unbelievable songs. You know, so I listen to some off-the-wall stuff, because when you mix a banjo with some bass, believe it or not, if you know what you're doing, you can mix it. I listen to uh, my favorite DJ is a guy named John Perdue. His name is DJ Silver. He's really famous in Vegas. He's toured with Nelly, Brad Paisley. He tours with Aldean right now. But he was one of the innovators of mixing music together. Like he's one of the first guys to put like Outkast with Waylon Jennings, and I mean mix songs. So if you get time, there's a there's a he does a song called Dixieland Delight, and uh, you can it's free stream it anywhere you want. But he mixes Alabama with Nappy Roots. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. So is he mixing the Alabama song? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll check it out. Weird Nappy. So Alabama is doing all the chorus, and Nappy Roots is doing all the, you know, the 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 bars. That's sweet. So, and I mean, the way it flows, if you ever listen to it, I mean, you'll listen to it a million times because it's so different. And that's, you know, but it tells a story. And that's again, that's what I love. I love stuff, you know, because I love Nappy Roots. You know, I love big timers. I love, man. I even still have the Shaquille O'Neal rap CD. Oh wow! Now we going back. I mean, I'm telling you both. You know, <laughs> boom shakalaka. <laughs> I, I lean on the Statue of Liberty when I get tired. I mean, I still listen to that. So I like it all. I just, I'm not into anything that has, you know, a lot of, a lot of cursing. I mean, a little bit don't bother me. A lot I don't even listen to. And, and I'm not into anything that is violent. As far as, you know, I'm not into gangster rap. You know, I'm not into stuff like that. Just, you know, X going to give it to you. I mean, that's probably as hardcore as I get. But, I mean, I, you know, I, I love Rough Riders. I love stuff like that. But past that, I mean, I just I never got into the real hardcore rap. Um, but, you know, like a lot of R&B, I mean, Clarence Carter's still the man. So, you know, Stroking still one of the best songs ever made. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I still listen to Otis Redding. I love listening to stuff like that. And I love listening to Dock of the Bay and the Temptations. I love stuff like that, man. Some Buddy Holly. I love me some Buddy Holly. You know, Buddy was pretty good. I mean, honestly, I I, I was never the one of his biggest fans, but I did. he had some good songs, some mm-hmm. good music. I mean, mm-hmm. he, uh, the Big Bopper and Buddy. And, you know, that's the whole, I'm sure you know, that's the whole way. Like, was it, who was it that got on the plane? Was it Buddy? That was Buddy, the, that was Buddy Holly, uh, and Big he, Bopper. And he took Waylon. Yeah, and he took Waylon's seat. Yes, sir. Waylon Jennings. Mm-hmm. Waylon got off the plane for him to get on. And, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. There's a guy that's in, uh, there's a guy out now called Struggle Jennings. It's Waylon's grandson. Mm-hmm. And he does his kind of, he, he's got a, it's some country rap, some, it's just, it's weird. But he mixes his stuff with some of Waylon's old stuff. Oh, wow. I check that out. And, oh, I'm telling you. Struggle Jennings, Yellow Wolf. See, I like Yellow Wolf. I still listen to Enemy, <laughs> Eminem. I still, I mean, you know, I still, I, there's nothing I don't listen to because, again, I, you know, I live in the truck. But, you know, I got to meet some artists that I grew up loving and got to meet some bands. And then I met some bands in the U.K. that I never really listened to a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, was it U2? Um, I can't even remember all their names, but, like, they're big bands over there. I met one of the guys from Queen. And oh, wow. Stuff. Yeah, it was really cool to meet them. You know, because I didn't—I knew who they were. Don't get me wrong, but I never was listening to their music a whole lot. So when I met them, it was like I wanted to meet them as like a fan. Right. I was meeting them like just a person, and I got to meet Ross Stewart, and uh, I know, of course, I know who he is. But um, you know, and, and when you meet them like that, it's so awesome because 
We didn't talk music. We talked everything but music. You know, because honestly, I didn't know many of their songs, so I couldn't really talk music with them. So, you know, we just got to talk about everything else. And I'm big into the world of darts. I love darts and got to meet some of the top world dart players. So I'm telling you, this this show has been such a blessing for opening doors for me and then allowing me to open those doors for other people. And that's that's what it's about to me. Are you going to put out another EP or you want to or what? Uh, you know... Amy's been talking to me about it. You know, I wrote a book, and uh, then I put out an EP, and it was really DJ Silver's idea, and uh, we did it with Five Star out of Nashville. Um, and it, it, honestly, it, it was probably the greatest thing I ever did because there's a song on there called Good As It Gets, and it's a song about my wife. And, I mean, how many people get the, I mean, how many people in the world get the opportunity to write a song that millions listen to that's about their wife? I mean, Kane Brown did it, you know, different people, but I'm saying... You know, I could get, I, you know, I can give her a lot of things in life, but man, I have a song that she can keep forever. It's about her, mm-hmm. and you know, then I wrote a song about hunting, then I wrote a song about my kids, and and so you know, I, I've thought about it. Um, you know, if I ever slow down a little bit, I might. I still pick around with a lot of stuff, but you know, in all honesty, I just assume somebody put one out, and I just help them write it. I mean, just do some songs with them, and you know. I'm, I'm not trying to be boastful, but, man, I, I got to stand in that spotlight for a minute. It was awesome. But, you know, if it helps somebody else get in that light, Bo, let them uh, shine. I mean, I'm getting old now, and I'm just, you know, I'm telling you, Bo, I'm just a regular dude, and, I mean, it ain't my time. I mean, I've got a whole path ahead of me, and if that ever happens, it happens. But, man, I'd rather see some of these folks that ain't had time to shine, shine. And with social media now, things are so different. So many people getting recognized and noticed. If I can use my platform to promote somebody who really has something to offer this world, then, oh, I'd rather do that than put myself back out there. So, And, and honestly, I've learned that by doing that, man, you know, you get greater rewards. You might not have as much money, but you're sure a lot happier. Folks, you want to keep in touch with Ron and Lizard Lick Towing and uh, Recovery. Ron, my friend, how can they stay in touch with you? Say hello or keep up what you're doing, conventions, if, if you're doing them. How can they do that, sir? Go to lizardlicktowing.com. Everything we do is on that web page, all our social media. We answer it personally. You know, don't get mad if you don't get asked for about three months, but we'll get to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, we stay busy in a funeral home family in July in Alabama, but that LizLickTorn.com, you can find us. We're, you know, we got a bunch of events coming up. We're getting ready to be in Tennessee. We're getting ready to be in Virginia. We're getting ready to be in Georgia. We're getting ready to be in West Virginia. So check us out. Uh, actually, we're at Rockingham Speedway next week, a uh, week after next. So, that's where you can find us. That's where you can come meet us, say hello, hang out, cut up with us, and just, just get licked. And before I let you go, would you care to do a promo for my show? Oh, you know I will, but Hey, this is Repo Ron from Lizard Lick Tone Recovery, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. We've got some great, great stuff coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour podcast. Please get out and check out our Facebook page. It has our podcast link and our YouTube link. You want to subscribe to the YouTube link because we got a lot of stuff that's going to be uh, coming down the pipe, plus giveaways, ticket giveaways, all kinds of good stuff, and please get out and check out Lizard Lick Towing. And uh, say hello to Ron. He won't bite you. Trust me. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. I appreciate the interview, my friend. Nah, I appreciate it, buddy. If you send me the links, man, I'll put it on our social media. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.